Okay. All right. Welcome, everybody, to another introduction to civil engineering class. Um, let's just knock out a couple of business matters really, really quickly. So all of you should have uh, submitted your project number three assignments. That's the, the flow charts of your different scenarios and um, having uploaded those to Learning Suite. And so I got a lot of questions from those, but uh, they were good questions. So that's awesome. Um, project number four is now fair game and it's uh, out and available for you. And I, and I think you guys are going to really like project number four because um, project number four deals with natural hazards and how natural hazards affect uh, our world and affect infrastructure. So I'm going to share with you my screen quickly. Um, this is a web page that you guys uh, hopefully will be able to see here. Of um, <clears throat> It's a gallery that uh, my students over the years have developed and created. I do a lot of research using drones and robotics um, and going into um, damaged areas after natural hazards, particularly earthquakes. And we try to model what happens. And we use the, the modeling for other stuff too. Uh, this is a cool website and uh, a lot of our models, even uh, a little mini Mount Rushmore and some fun stuff here. Uh, but for this project, you guys are going to go in and you're going to compare some of these 3D models from one of the cities that was affected by the 2016 Central Italy earthquake sequence. Uh, in particular, I think the assignment has you look at a little village called Pescara del Tronto. Just a teeny little mountain village. It was uh, founded like over a thousand years ago. Um, and you're going, to be, you're going to be using these 3D models here um, to make some observations about uh, the damage that was caused in the city by the earthquake. And so you'll be able to explore and to, to investigate and to look around. You can see some landslides. You definitely can see lots of collapsed buildings, um, lots of things to note and to see. And you'll go, um, the part of that assignment is you're gonna compare, I think, um, different models. So this is the same city. That was, that was after the first earthquake. Um, two large earthquakes later, this is the city now. And let's see if we can get in here. The uh, zoom is slowing down the internet. But, ah, there it is. So it basically looks like a landfill now. So um, here's the first one. Here's the second one, just two months later. And so um, you guys will be able to go in and make some observations. And uh, so, yeah, go ahead and get a head start on project number four. I think you guys will like this project. And you certainly have a lot of fun playing with these models. You'll be opening up these models on your own computer. All you need is a web browser. You can even open them up on your smartphone or tablet if you want. So that'll be really, really helpful. Okay. Um, so, any quick questions before we get started today? Okay, awesome. So, um, what we're going to do is just uh, bust in to the presentation I've got for you today. Um, I'm going to give you a presentation on um, an introduction to geotechnical engineering. And geotechnical engineering is uh, what I have done uh, for my career. Let me pull this up. Let's see. Here we go. So you guys should all be able to see this now. Uh, geotechnical engineering is what I did for my career. Um, in 2004, I selected that, uh, went to graduate school. 
I worked six years as a professional engineer, um, worked on a lot of cool projects. I actually didn't work on this project. Uh, this is a, kind of a grainy picture of the uh, Provo City Center Temple before it was the Provo City Center Temple. Uh, this is after the fire damaged it, uh, I think in 2008 or 2009, maybe 2010, I can't remember which year it was, around there. And uh, the church announced that they were going to convert it into a temple. And that's all great. You know, you have this historic structure with walls that are more than 100 years old. But uh, how do you build a structure that doesn't have a basement uh, and add a basement after the outside of the structure has already been built? Well, you do it like this. Uh, and what made this even more challenging was that this is a site that has very high groundwater. Um, groundwater is probably less than five feet below the ground surface. Um, and so the basement of this Provo City Center Temple is actually underwater. And they had a design for that. And uh, so it's almost like an inverted bathtub. Uh, I, the, uh, some friends of mine that work at a company called Nicholson Construction, they were the firm that designed this foundation support system and the excavation uh, that would allow then the uh, basement of the temple to be constructed um, and all the parking facilities and everything. Um, and so if you go and visit the temple now, it's a, just a wonderfully beautiful facility. But this picture, I, I really like this picture <laughs> because it sums up geotechnical engineering in a single image, <clears throat> which is out of the box and challenging. Uh, geotechnical engineering, there are, you know, it, there are no uh, cookie cutter or Betty Crocker solutions. Everything is different. Everything is unique. Every site is different from another site. And that's one of the things that I absolutely loved about geotechnical engineering. So uh, just a couple of examples we'll dive into. Uh, most of you hopefully know what the structure is. You've seen it before. The Leaning Tower of Pisa. It's been around since the 1200s. And when they started to construct it, um, <clears throat> everybody should hopefully see my arrow. When they started to construct it, it started to lean very, very early on. And then the, uh, the builders knew, okay, we're in trouble. So um, instead of stopping and trying to address the problem, like most of us do it yourselfers, we tried to come up with a, a quick and dirty fix. They tried to tilt the building backwards as they kept building it upwards. And that didn't work. Uh, the building just continued to tilt and tilt and tilt. They've tried various fixes over the years, but it got to the point where um, about in the 19, late 80s, early 90s, they had to have cables wrapping this thing. And uh, those cables were anchored back uh, a couple, maybe 100 or 200 yards to try to keep it from tipping over. But, but that was incredibly dangerous because uh, those cables were placing enormous pressures on these columns and on the building, basically uh, like, wanting to cut the building in half. And so um, they, they came up with a really clever fix for this, actually. Uh, they came on the backside where my arrow is uh, hovering, and they got a, a, a custom-made little drill that drills horizontally, and they drilled horizontally down beneath the foundation on this backside, and they started just drilling out soil and creating void space down there as they created voice space that caused this side of the building to sink and to tip. And that straightened the building out more. So the building got to something like eight degrees, nine degrees tilt. And they say if it ever got to 13 degrees, it was lights out, it was over. Uh, and now it's back something closer to four degrees tilt, but it's just a temporary fix. Uh, it will last maybe another hundred years and then they're going to need to do something more permanent again. Here's some other buildings that are tipped over. Uh, this, these are apartment buildings in the city of um, Niigata, Japan, that tipped over in 1964. But they didn't tip over because of poor foundation design. Uh, they tipped over because a giant earthquake occurred and it liquefied the soil on which the buildings were sitting. And so some of these buildings, they sank into the ground, others just tipped over. It almost looks like the buildings you would have uh, if you flooded your sandbox and, and stuff just kind of tipped over and sank. 
Um, interestingly, people were climbing out of these windows and walking down the sides of the buildings. It, it was a mess. Uh, notice how structurally the buildings appear fine. Uh, they just tipped over. And so, you know, a tipped over building is uh, not a functional building. And all of these buildings were total losses. So um, here's another example of, uh, of an interesting geotechnical train wreck. This is uh, what's called a tailings dam failure. <coughs> this was in Hungary in 2010. A tailings dam um, is a place where wherever you have an open pit mine or, or, or lots of closed pit mines have these as well. well. When you have a mine and you're just cutting out material um, and you extract all the minerals and the metals that you're interested in, you still have a lot of sludge left over. And you got to put that sludge somewhere. And so we build these facilities called tailings dams or sometimes tailings ponds. Um, and they're just basically uh, slurry landfills is a way to think of them. And they're huge. They can be 200, 300, 400 feet high. Uh, imagine how much material that would constitute. Well, uh, here in Hungary, the wall that was containing all of that failed and all that material went downstream and flooded a couple of villages. We'll, we'll talk more about that one in a couple minutes. Uh, closer to home, this is a retaining wall failure in New York. Um, this uh, property and yard was built in the early 1900s. Uh, they wanted a yard. It's New York City. You don't really get yards in New York City unless you do something really extravagant like build a 40-foot retaining wall like this. And uh, so they did have a yard, but not for long. Um, this occurred uh, probably within the last 10 years. And uh, there was a particularly wet and rainy season and uh, the wall failed and it flooded uh, and ran out onto this little highway here. Fortunately, no one was injured or killed. Um, but again, it's just a very interesting case history from us to, to learn from. Here's another case history. Uh, this is another very large mine, an open pit mine in Australia near the city of Yalorn. Um, one of the largest open pit mines in the world actually and they had a massive failure of one of their slopes and it, and, uh, it came in um, it doesn't look very big compared to the size of the mine but believe me that that thing is about the size of a mountain um, and so that uh, is a is a pretty scary failure there um, that cost the mine billions of dollars to clean up um, here's another example of a geotechnical failure, and this one is probably familiar to all of you, at least you've heard of it. The levee failures in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina in 2005. So <clears throat> this, uh, this is a canal that runs through the city, and if you look carefully, the water level uh, in this canal is about the height of midway up these houses. Um, and so the water in the canal is higher than the ground outside of the canal. And so you have these big uh, mounds of soil called levees that are protecting the communities from floods. But the levees weren't really kept very well. And they had lots of deficiencies and they weren't prepared for the storm surge that came from Hurricane Katrina. And all it took was a failure in one place and the entire French Quarter of New Orleans flooded and resulted in the fatalities of, <clears throat> of a few thousand people. Uh, it was a horribly tragic event, but one that we learned a lot from. And it kicked off a massive movement to spend uh, billions and billions of dollars here in the U.S. improving and updating levees all around the country. So what do all these occurrences have in common? Well, they're all soil related failures um, and and it's not like geotechnical engineering is the engineering that deals with failure we try to stay away from failure as much as possible but the reason i show you these is because they're the equivalent of a train wreck they're really awful and but you can't look away from it um, and so they're really interesting and they grasp your attention um, as geotechnical engineers, we try to avoid those things that I just shared with you. 
Uh, so what kinds of things are we talking about? With the Leaning Tower of Pizza, not pizza, Pisa, we have soil settlement. With the Niigata apartment buildings, it's a failure due to soil liquefaction following an earthquake. With the Tailings Dam in Hungary, it's increased pore pressure and slope instability. With the retaining wall collapse, it was a failure of a retaining wall from lateral earth pressures. With the uh, open pit mine in Australia, that was a slope stability failure. And with the levee failure following Hurricane Katrina, that was a seepage and slope stability problem. So all of these have to do with geotechnical engineering. So really the, the fundamental underlying question for today's lesson is what do geotechnical engineers do? What are geotechnical engineers? So I boiled it down to a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> first, one of the things that we do most commonly is we design foundations. So most of you probably know that of a structure, the structure has multiple parts. The foundation is the part of the structure that connects the superstructure to the earth. And it's what transfers all the loads from the superstructure into the soil so that the soil or the rock in the earth can support the weight of that structure. Uh, it's arguably the most important or critical element of the structure. And you never see it because it's buried, it's beneath the structure. But if you have a, a, even a teeny little problem with the foundation, it's going to manifest itself in all sorts of ways throughout the entire structure. So there's tons of different foundations out there. But we can take all of those foundations and boil them into just two basic categories. The first category is called shallow foundations. So a shallow foundation uh, is a, a foundation that we can just dig a hole from the ground surface and we place the foundation. Uh, we often call them footings because they kind of look like a foot, like this picture shows. And uh, they can be individual column footings. So we have a column through which load is being carried and, and it goes into a footing and the footing's on the ground. Or it could be a wall footing, like around the perimeter of a building. A mat foundation is where your column footings are so close together that it, it just doesn't really even make sense to have separate footings anymore. Instead, you just excavate out the whole area and you pour one giant concrete footing and all the columns come down into the same thing. And so it's just like a big concrete mat. So here's a picture of uh, some workers in a, uh, I believe this is a, uh, a Central American country and they're building a wall footing for a, just a residential house. And so, uh, you know, this type of construction happens all over the world and it's very, very basic, but very, very important. Now, the second category of foundation is called deep foundations. So what if the soil at near the surface of your ground is just so bad, so muddy, mucky, soft, gooey, that there's no way it's going to hold up your structure? Well, then we're going to use a deep foundation because maybe deeper down in the soil, there's a better soil layer a more competent, denser layer that can support the loads of your structure. So we have to somehow get the loads from our structure on the surface all the way down to that competent soil layer. So we're going to use these deep foundations. So there's different types of deep foundations. There's, there's driven, there's drilled, um, they have what are called piles or pylons or caissons. Uh, and so this picture that you see here is a square reinforced concrete pile that's being driven into the ground. Um, it's up on its end and this hammer here that's being suspended from the crane is a diesel hammer and it just sits here and bangs on the top of that pile until it pounds it down into the ground. Now, now you may think that this is kind of uh, Neanderthalish maybe like, oh, anybody can do that. But there's actually a lot of science and calculations that need to go into this. And we need to look at the energy that's being transmitted into the pile very carefully. If you put too big of a pile on there, or I'm sorry, too big of a hammer onto your pile, it'll just blow your pile apart. 
if you put too small of a hammer on there, it's, it's like, it's the same thing as like death by Chinese water torture. It'll just sit there and bang on your pile. Your pile won't move, but that hammer is just obliterating the top of your pile. And so you need to select just the perfect hammer that's going to put enough energy to drive that pile down into the soil. Alternatively, you can drill the hole first and then backfill it with concrete and put your steel in and then that would be a drilled foundation. There's advantages to both, but um, deep foundations are really, really useful. For example, <clears throat> in this picture here, uh, the, the developer and the owner of this site, they wanna develop a, a casino and a restaurant right on the shore of this lake. They thought that that would attract customers and they'd make some money off of that. Uh, the problem is it's really hard to build a building on top of water. And so you need structural elements that go down to something competent. So they've driven uh, these reinforced concrete piles into the, into the ground, all in the water. And they're also doing it along the shoreline. So there's one crane here that's using a hammer on the shore. You see another crane here that's on a barge. So they can pull this barge out into the water and that's probably what drove uh, these piles out here in the water. And you can see this pile of piles that are sitting here just waiting to be, to be driven. So now once the piles are in place and they're proven and they have their capacities, then we turn it over to the structural engineer and say, here you go. Now you have some really steady elements to build your structure on. Another thing that geotechnical engineers commonly do is design retaining walls or earth retention systems. All of you have seen retaining walls. They're everywhere. They surround us. Anytime you drive through a canyon or a mountain pass or anytime you drive under a bridge, you always see these types of walls. And those, <clears throat> those walls serve really two purposes. The first purpose is to keep the soil from collapsing down and killing you. Uh, the second purpose is to look nice. And so uh, old retaining walls, they were just giant piles of boulder. They, they, they took up tons of space and they really weren't that effective. Retaining walls today, because they have um, structural elements inside of the soil, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, they can be very elegant, almost perfectly vertical. And, and now they, uh, they design them to be very aesthetic. So for instance, if you drive up Provo Canyon uh, towards like Heber City, where, where I'm going to go soon for uh, the football game, uh, or towards Sundance, you're going to pass several of these walls, but, but you may not even notice it because they've, they've, uh, they play shotcrete over the uh, retained soil, and then they come in and they hired artists to come sculpt it and to stain it and paint it to look like the natural rock of the canyon. And so uh, you, most people don't even realize that they're driving past retaining walls uh, when they drive up Provo Canyon, but uh, it's really quite remarkable. Uh, this is a grainy picture, but uh, it was the best I could find on the internet of a wall that was built maybe 15 years ago. Uh, this wall supports a new runway that was built at the SeaTac Airport between Seattle and Tacoma. They needed a new runway, but they didn't have space for it because it's really kind of hilly terrain. They needed a nice level ground, so they had to create level ground. So this wall is about 75, 80-ish feet tall. And the interesting thing about this wall is it's vertical. There's really no slope to it. And the panels that you see, each of those little gray panels on the outside of the wall are only about this thick maybe six to eight inches thick. Those panels aren't doing a thing to hold up the wall. What's holding up the wall are structural elements inside the soil, strips of metal that have been placed in layers in the soil, and they give tens tensile strength to the soil so the soil can just hold itself up. And so uh, those little panels that you see on the outside of the wall are just there to keep the soil from eroding away on the surface. Um, and so you can create these, these all, I mean, you can go as high as you want. I mean, at the time, uh, this wall was the tallest MSE. It's called an MSE wall. It stands for mechanically stabilized earth wall. It was at the time, this was the tallest MSE wall in the world. Um, we've surpassed that now. I'm not sure which, 
what the tallest wall is to date, but it's, it's definitely taller than this one. And it's just absolutely remarkable uh, how tall we can go with these MSE walls. Um, a third thing that geotechnical engineers do is we design pavements and the subgrade systems for those pavements. Um, in all of my career, six years as a consulting engineer, one of the things that I did the most was help work on um, transportation projects. So bridges, overpasses, and pavements for roads. And that's because there's so much demand for transportation today. So if you're ever driving down the road and you hit that pothole and it about rips your car to pieces and you curse, don't blame the transportation engineer, blame the geotechnical engineer because that's a sign of poor sub-base. Or, well, it also could be that the road needs to be replaced and the, the Department of Transportation is just waiting. But we all know that in the state of Utah, um, they're always doing construction on the road, so that wouldn't possibly be it. But anyway, the sub-base here that, are, uh, that you see in these pictures, this machines, or these machines are laying out the sub-base, they're compacting it, they're watering it, and it's all very carefully designed so that it can be optimal in supporting the pavement materials that uh, are placed on, um, on that soil. So hopefully it'll delay the onset of cracking and ruts and, and um, potholes. If any of you have ever driven on I-84 up by um, Boise, so like between Meridian or Nampa and Boise, you know what I mean by ruts, right? It's, if you change lanes, you actually catch air uh, when you drive those roads. So that's really scary. Okay, something else that geotechnical engineers do commonly is design tunnel systems. Now, not all geotechnical engineers do this because this is kind of a specialized thing um, <clears throat> because you have to have a, a very strong background in engineering geology as well as geotechnical engineering because you're dealing a lot with rocks. And so, uh, but, but the design of tunnels is really, really fascinating. So if you think about it, if, if you've got to get from point A to point B and you've got some obstacle in your way, whether it's a mountain, whether it's a, a, a big city uh, that's highly congested or it's a river or something like that, you traditionally we think, okay, we'll go over it or go around it. But sometimes those aren't the most cost effective way to do it. Sometimes the most cost effective solution is to just go through it or to go under it. And that's where tunnels come into play. Now, if any of you have been to any of the large cities on the East Coast, like Boston, you've driven through tunnels. You know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, tunnels have been around for a really long time, but we don't build tunnels anymore by sending you know, hordes of workers in with, with mattocks and picks, and, and they're bracing up everything with timbers, and you know, it's not 1840 anymore. Um, instead, we use very sophisticated machinery uh, called tunnel boring machines, TBMs. These tunnel boring machines act like, uh, like moving factories. Imagine like a giant worm that is like anywhere between 10 to 50 feet in diameter. And these things just move through rock and soil. and uh, here on the left where you have the grinding head, that's where it cuts. And by the time you get to the end of the factory, you have a finished reinforced lined tunnel that's waterproof and ready for any type of construction. And so it's just like a one-stop shop, but that thing just moves through. Um, in under really good conditions, it can go a couple hundred feet a day through solid rock. Um, Interestingly, these types of machines struggle more with soil than they do rock. It's easier to go through rock. Uh, here's a link here. I just found out that this link isn't working anymore. So whoever created this video I wanted to share with you, their video got pulled down uh, or they took it off. So I can't share it with you. But if you just search tunnel boring machine, uh, there's some really cool videos that you guys can see on Google 
of, of or in YouTube how these machines work. So there's a picture, a close up of one. You can kind of see the cutting heads. They have these discs. Um, sometimes the discs have um, diamond linings on them. Usually they're not, they're just usually just carbide and so they can replace them really, really quickly. And they need to replace them like every day basically. Uh, and so as this thing spins, it just grinds up the rock and the rock goes into these holes and then gets carried out through uh, these conveyor belt systems and, and move right on out of the tunnel. And uh, then they have a concrete factory in here that, that creates the lining for these tunnels. So very, very cool stuff. Okay, another thing that engineers, geotechnical engineers do very commonly is we engineer stable slopes. We, we deal with slope stability. So um, people always wanna build on slopes for some reason. It's something about being right on the edge, having this tremendous, awesome view. The problem is um, gravity. Gravity wants to pull everything down slope. Uh, you know, if gravity had its way, there would be no hills and slopes. Everything would be nice and flat and plain. And so uh, geotechnical engineers often have their hands full trying to protect infrastructure, design infrastructure to go uh, beneath, on, or, above, or next to uh, slopes. <coughs> and one of the biggest challenges is when you have a lot of rain because rain just triggers these these slope instabilities but even in dry places like so here's a gold mine in russia uh, it's not just rain and stuff that causes these instabilities so uh here is this gold mine and in this gold mine they have um there's this ore deposit of gold and it's just located kind of like right here in the center and you know, if the if the owner of the mine had his way, he would just go straight down and get the gold. And because that that minimizes how much money he has to spend cutting material away, uh, he can just go straight after the gold. But the problem is, you can't do vertical cuts. You got to remember that these walls here are several hundreds of feet high. In some instances, like with the Kennecott mine. Um, the walls are a couple thousand feet high. And so we're talking about millions of pounds of force and uh, tons, just millions of um, pounds of stress that are down here in this rock. And so if you have vertical walls, everything will just come collapsing in. So an engineer has to optimize what do we make the side slopes, how, how much do we have to slope the sides to keep the mine safe and open, but minimize the money that we lose by doing that? Because we just want to chase the, the, the ore, the, that little nugget of gold that's in there. So some things that engineers often do to try to increase slope stability is they put elements into the, the soil or the rock these can be anything from fabrics to plastics to metal to foam to membranes to composite materials. We've, we've learned how if we make these hybridized uh, soil slopes or rock slopes that it's just a lot stronger. So this is an example where uh, we put down a plastic or a poly grid and then we start covering it with soil. So that grid adds tensile strength to that soil and can help keep it together instead of failing and sloughing and sliding away. So like those mechanically stabilized earth walls we saw for the SeaTac airport, this is kind of how they construct it. They lay out their liners, then they lay some soil on top of it and compact it. Then they lay more liners out, their grid, and then they put more soil. So now you just got this layering of soil grid soil grid soil grid all the way up to the surface and that reinforced soil mass is what holds itself up the face of the wall which will be down here where this guy is standing that face of the wall really doesn't doesn't feel or, or support any pressure from the soil behind it it just prevents erosion from occurring and so uh, it's a really clever design we also worry about stability of things like dams and levees. And I've said this before, but um, 
our society is so incredibly dependent upon dams. And in most of the cities here in the Western United States just wouldn't exist. In California, Nevada, Las, uh, in, in Arizona, the whole state of Arizona wouldn't exist. And much of Utah wouldn't exist if we didn't have dams. They store our potable water and they would allow these large cities to even exist. But imagine the forces that are going on in this dam trying to knock it over. And so geotechnical engineers are the engineers that, that design and engineer these things so that they don't fall over and they can keep our communities safe. It's the same with flood control levees. So um, we're getting close to the end here. Let's just jump back into the train wrecks, the geotechnical failures, because I know these, these are really kind of the fun things to talk about. Um, so if we have foundation problems, whether we have settlement of the ground, where the ground settles and, and shifts down, or we have heaving. In other words, there's some soils that when they get wet, they swell and they heave. Anytime you have any of that differential movement going on, you're going to get cracking in your structure. So you'll see stuff like this. And if you guys go to like old parts of cities where they have all these, these brick line stores, you'll see stuff like that all the time in these old structures. And that can occur either because the foundation settled or because the foundation heaved. Very, very common uh, issue to deal with with geotechnical engineers. You know, in your more extreme cases, you have the, uh, the settlement like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. <clears throat> but it's not just settlement, it's also just the sheer failure of the soil. So here's a picture back from the 1930s. Some farmer had a really tall grain silo. He filled the silo all the way up, but that silo was never engineered. The foundation for it was never designed. And the soil beneath that soil or beneath that silo was not strong enough to hold, to physically hold all of that weight from all that grain. And so what happened was that grain created a driving force in the soil. And the soil tried to resist it by, through friction and it did its best, but it, it wasn't enough. The friction wasn't enough to resist it. So you ended up uh, sliding along this plane here and the whole thing just tipped over and you got this big heave of the soil off to the side of it. This is what we call a bearing capacity failure. And bearing capacity failures are like the big no-no in geotechnical engineering. We, we avoid these things like the plague because once you fail that foundation, you're not getting it back. The soil is in a weakened state and, and it will support much less load from that point on. Now, you might look at me and say, Dr. Frankie, that's all great, but that's the 1930s. This is 2020. That kind of stuff doesn't happen anymore, right? Not necessarily. Uh, this is a picture of a tipped over building within the last 10 years from China. Here's another picture of it. Um, you can see the pile sticking out of the bottom. So this was a combination mat and pile foundation. And there was an excavation off to the left where they were building more buildings and they were piling up all the dirt from the excavation on the right side of the building. Uh, here's a closer look. All those piles, they, they were just clipped like broken toothpicks. Those piles did nothing to prevent the failure of that soil. So here's a little schematic. It's, it's shown in uh, Mandarin. I, I'm not fluent in Mandarin, but I'm pretty sure that uh, this says rain. Um, so here's the building. Here's a schematic of the excavation. And you can see all the, the soil that they were excavating, they piled on this side. So they had heavy rains and the rain got the soil wet and it increased the weight of that soil. And that weight all was just trying to drive and push itself um, and spread out because of gravity. So it wanted to go back into this hole basically. And this building is in the way. But eventually that weight got more than the soil that's, that's in the way could resist it. And uh, because there was no resistance over here where the excavation occurred, the, uh, the soil failed. Uh, there was a slope failure into the excavation and it just sheared right through those piles 
and tip the building over. So yeah, I mean, this stuff happens even today in developing countries and developed nations across the world. Uh, let's learn a little bit more about the dam failure here, uh, the tailings dam. So a couple things, uh, here is a, here is a bird's eye view of the dam. And you can see that uh, there's a hole right here and this is where everything came out. So you kind of see the discoloration. The, the dam um, flooded two villages, a village called Kolontar and then a very large city called Devek Ser. Look, I, I don't speak Hungarian. I know I'm just slaughtering that. If any of you served a mission in Hungary, I'm sorry. But anyway, um, yeah, there are, uh, I think, at least 100,000 people that live in that city, if I'm not mistaken. And they got buried. They got buried by this toxic sludge um, from this tailings dam. And this stuff is carcinogenic. And it buried portions of these, these communities under a couple feet of this stuff. And so there's really no recovery from that. These cities had to be completely abandoned, uh, which is a tragedy. And so geotechnical engineers have to always be on guard for this kind of stuff. Maybe you heard more recently about one of these uh, happening in Brazil. Uh, and it took out an entire little village of all the miners that were working on that tailings dam. So these things are continuing to happen even today. Uh, another example of a landslide in, um, in Japan this time, uh, I have a link here to a YouTube video. We'll see if we can pull it up. Now, they knew the landslide was occurring. They had sensors in, they could, they could plot it, they could see that it was happening. Well, there's something you don't see every day. And um, yeah, that was a tragic event. And um, at least several dozens of people were killed from that landslide. You can see it all spread out over the homes and the houses here. Uh, here's another community uh, that was impacted by a, a slope failure. The final thing I wanna talk about is soil liquefaction from an earthquake. Um, we won't talk about this in the undergraduate courses, but in uh, my 545 class, we talk about soil liquefaction in depth. Um, you know, for now, just think of it as um, where the soil turns to like, like quicksand because of the earthquake. Here's another quick little video. This was recorded in 2011 in Tokyo, Japan. Okay, we have earthquake right now. And this is actually moving. You see the cracks moving? That crack was not there. Do you see the swaying back and forth of the crack? The whole earth is moving. I felt like I was drunk. <laughs> I don't know what that feels like, but that's okay. Check this out, watch the crack. Crack is just moving. I can scoot forward. It's almost like waves, watch this. Because I didn't know what was going on. I could just feel. Oh, here we go. Right here. Here's coming up to the sidewalk. Buildings were making a racket. I seriously thought I was sick first because I didn't know what was going on. I could just feel like I was disoriented. Stepping over another crack. So you guys can see what's going on there. Hey, everybody, let's raise your hands. Professor Brinke? Yes. 
Never mind. I was just going to ask if we should take attendance now. Yep, let's do it. You got me. Okay, everyone keep your, your virtual hands raised, please. So soil liquefaction occurs because of earthquakes and uh, it can cause some pretty serious damage, right? You see things like cars buried in the, in the middle of the road. Um, it, it, liquefaction doesn't really kill anybody, but it can really cause serious damage to infrastructure that's built um, around uh, where the liquefaction is occurring. And so, um, but, but it can kill people if it is, uh, occurs in conjunction with slope instability. So for instance, in 1964 in Alaska, the Anchorage earthquake there was massive. Soil liquefaction occurred right beneath downtown Anchorage. And it caused what's called the L Street landslide that took like a huge chunk of downtown, a few blocks, and just ran it right out into um, the, the Prince William Sound, right out into the ocean. And so, um, yeah, some people lost their lives in that one too. And so, um, we, we do have to engineer and, and design and try to predict when liquefaction is going to occur. So um, that's all I have with the presentation today. I've got just a couple minutes, maybe um, one or two minutes to answer any questions you guys might have. Do you guys have any questions? How do you like design around the liquefaction of soil? Well, we try to predict when liquefaction is going to occur and if it would occur for the design earthquake at that site. And then if we predict it will, we try to improve the properties of the soil so that it won't liquefy in the earthquake. So we, we change the soil. Good question. So how does one change the soil? Would you just bring in a bunch of dump trucks with different types of soil or? Sometimes. Uh, usually we just make the soil more dense. Liquefaction only happens in soil that's really, really young and really loose. And, but if we could just get the soil to be compacted really tight together, then it's not a problem. And so often we just have to densify the soil. Any other questions? Professor Frankie, there's a question on chat. Okay. Again, I'm not looking at chat because I'm reading or I'm, I'm giving the it's presentation. It's from Trevor. Uh -huh. He asked what kind of foundations are used in areas like Minnesota that have clay? Uh, yeah, good question. So if it's really stiff clay, you can use shallow foundations and they'll work just fine. Um, if, it's, if it's goopy clay, then you've got to use deep foundations. Um, I know in Minnesota, they use a lot of deep foundations. I know some of the engineers there that work for the DOT, um, some professors at some universities up there. Um, yeah, they, they specialize in deep foundations up there. They're really good. Okay, any other questions? I had one question, Professor. Sure. Um, so for, so in the terms of like geotechnical engineering with like dealing with some of these, as you said, like train wrecks sort of things. So to kind of prevent these things from happening, is it more so a case that in the beginning when you're actually building it, you need to make sure you do it right. And then if you didn't, then it'll collapse later. Or is it more so you also have to tend to it um, throughout its lifetime to kind of, like you said, like examine it, make sure something's not the issue. and how do you kind of just make these things actually last like a decent, like a long time? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, the, the short answer is, is kind of both, but, but more of the upfront design. Once, if you build and design a foundation right, it should last for the, the lifetime of the structure. But there are certain soil conditions that can be really tricky and dangerous. Um, for instance, um, I worked on a medical facility in eastern Idaho called the Port Newf Medical Center or something like that. It's just a big uh, hospital up there, in, I think in Pocatello or something like that. And um, the soils around there are wind-blown silts that are called LUS. And LUS is a tricky soil because 
if it gets wet, it collapses. And uh, you can have enormous settlements if, if it gets wet. And so when we made our recommendations uh, to the owner and the structural engineer for that hospital, we said, by all means, do not wet this soil, keep it dry, and uh, then you should be fine. A couple years later, I was driving through and I looked up and I said, ah, see, I worked on that, that structure right there. Uh, and then I saw all these huge sprinklers just spraying all over the place up there, you know, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay, so they're, you know, they're going to ignore our recommendation. Um, and, and if they're gonna do that, then you know, they're, they're potentially encouraging big settlements occurring in their soil. Not, you know, not from the little trickle down of the sprinklers, but if they had a sprinkler line break, for instance, and you got serious water coming out in one spot, that soil would just collapse. So, that's just one example, but but most of the time, it's just focus on um, the design up front, and and make sure that it's constructed according to design. Anyway, okay, guys, this was a really um, fun opportunity to share with you what I am passionate about. If you have any other questions about geotechnical engineering, you can approach me or any of the other geotechnical faculty here. There's the, there's Professor Kyle Rollins and our department chair. Uh, Professor Norm Jones. You can approach any of us and we'll be happy to talk with you more about it. But um, with that being said, we are going to um, end class and uh, good luck on project number four and I'll look forward to seeing you guys next week. Thanks, Dr. Frank. Thank you. Thank you. See ya.